Well, it's yeah, in some regards, it's kind of a tough question because, again, as we talked about last week, it's a very diverse movement. But uh, there tend to be some common themes to to emerging church uh, worship services. First of all, one of the things that you, you basically will never hear them referred to as worship services. Uh, they tend to refer them or to refer to themselves as gatherings or or communities or a variety of ways. But uh, they tend to all have a few common themes. Uh, uh, a, heavy, a heavy reliance on community participation within. The, uh, the process of the worship uh, gathering or service um, and, and by participation I mean uh, there's generally a lot of freedom for people to get up and move around while the service is happening a lot of times there will be uh, different uh, uh, stations that people can go to throughout the worship gathering uh, art stations where you can participate in, in, a, in an artistic expression uh, different prayer stations where you can participate in different forms of prayer. Uh, generally, there's uh, uh, music is is is, uh, is a pretty key piece to the emergent church uh, worship services. A lot of times, these churches will will write their own music. Uh, so if you are you are a visitor to one of these emergent churches, you wouldn't necessarily recognize the uh, the songs that they were playing. Uh, a lot of them like to to write their own music that reflects their own uh, community's identity. Uh, in terms of the the teaching or the preaching that you would experience in the in, in many emergent churches, a lot of times uh, an, an official sermon from from up front from a pastor uh, is really uh, in many regards downplayed, and in uh, the teaching piece tends to be much more of a uh, an interactive uh, community participation kind of an event. Uh, usually, the pastor will almost uh, in, in, in some regards moderate a discussion where uh, he'll lead people through a biblical passage or a topic for the night and, and there's a lot of give and, give and take between uh, between the pastor and the people there within the church in terms of sharing their own ideas and their own opinions on the, the particular topic or passage and so, uh, so basically one of the ways that I would sum it all up is while for probably the average evangelical out there who's going to church on a Sunday morning uh, we would experience our church worship service as being pretty uh, structured in terms of uh, when we go in, we understand that there's going to be some songs and a formal sermon, maybe a time of prayer, uh, communion, you know, whatever. But within the emergent church, the services tend to be much more uh, loose, far less structure, much more free-flowing and, and open to uh, kind of uh, change as the, uh, as the uh, spirit leads, if you would. So... Yeah, I heard that some emergent churches, they, they use techniques like the uh, walking the labyrinth and candles, icons, incense, and it seems to be like, like a move back to medieval Catholicism and some Eastern mysticism. Why, why is that? Well, one of the reasons why we've seen some of these uh, different kinds of elements come into the emergent church is because the emergent church places a, a tremendous emphasis on experience within the worship gathering. Where uh, they believe that one of the key, the, one of the key aspects of the postmodern culture today is that people don't simply want to uh, be fed information. Uh, people would rather experience, uh, have experiences for themselves to determine for themselves what is true. So instead of having a pastor uh, preach from the front behind a pulpit, telling the church what to believe, what is true, what the scriptures say. Uh, within the emergent church, what you find is uh, these churches tend to try to create experiences for people where they can kind of discover uh, and have an encounter with God on their own terms. And so that's why there's been a lot of incorporation into the emergent church of uh, a lot of uh, ancient practices, ancient spiritual practices, mystical practices, uh, a lot of things from the ancient Catholic church, uh, different forms of prayer and meditation, like you mentioned, walking prayer labyrinth, uh, contemplative prayer, uh, Lectio Divina meditation, um, yoga meditation, which comes out of an Eastern Hindu tradition. All of these things are, are experiential elements that have been incorporated today into the emergent church. Other than the experience, you wrote in one of your articles that you believe that the emergent church questions the validity of key historical biblical doctrines. Can you just give us an example of some of them? Well, let me let me just share a, a quote with you that I have here in front of me from uh, Tony Campolo, and uh, Tony is a you know a famous uh, 
Christian evangelist that a lot of people recognize, but Tony in recent years has become uh, very closely affiliated with the Emergent Church. And uh, Tony here makes a great statement that really summarizes what you're asking. Uh, this comes from a, a website called journalnow.com. Tony says, These church members tend to think that the crusade against homosexual marriage is a waste of time and energy, and they tend to reject the exclusivistic claims that many evangelicals make about salvation. They are not about to damn the likes of Gandhi or the Dalai Lama to hell simply because they have not embraced Christianity. Now, just in that short quote there, Tony reveals a, a number of things that would be very troubling to me and, and other conservative evangelicals. Uh, when, when you get to a place where you're rejecting the exclusive claims of Jesus Christ, uh, that, in my opinion, is probably the central message of Christianity, that salvation is found in no one else apart from Jesus Christ. And so one of the things that really troubles me about the emergent church is this, uh, this openness to people of other religions and other faiths and a, and a real unwillingness to really challenge them and confront them on, in terms of their, uh, their spiritual beliefs. Uh, you know, no one likes to go around damning people to hell. I mean, we, we, that is, when we speak of hell, we should speak of hell with tears, as Francis Schaeffer used to say. But the problem is, hell is a reality. And so, you know, to simply say that, you know, Gandhi and the Dalai Lama, because they were nice guys, are, are going to be safe from, from eternal damnation one day, uh, to me is really just a dangerous place to get to. And uh, and just underlies uh, underlines one of the key uh, key errors within this emergent church movement. So is is it basically that a universal uh, universalistic salvation that they preach? Well, you know, I I, I call it a quasi universalism, a quasi universalistic view of salvation because there to to this day I know of no leader within the emergent church who has embra- fully embraced in a universalistic view of salvation. But at the same time, what you find is a lot of these leaders within the emergent church uh, making comments and statements that uh, it, it really, it's almost like they want to get as close to that line as they can without completely jumping over it. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, just to give you an example, Brian McLaren, who is probably the leading spokesman of the emergent church uh, in his book, A New Kind of Christian, uh, Brian McLaren makes the statement, he says, the world is better off for having these religions speaking of the non-Christian religions, the world is better off for having these religions than having no religion at all, or just one, even if it were ours. They aren't the enemy of the gospel in my mind. You know, when you get to the point where you say that the world is better off for having the false religions, uh, better off than having just one religion, even if it were ours, Christianity, I mean, what are you trying to say there? Uh, the, the Bible is very clear. It, Romans 1, 18-32 says that the false religions of the world are godless, they're wicked, they're fools. Uh, 1 John chapter 2 uh, says that the false religions are liars and antichrists. Um, you know, what does this do to the great commission of Jesus Christ? Jesus said to go into all the world and make disciples. Well, if the world is better off for having all these non-Christian religions, then, then why even bother with the great commission? You know, and and so these are just some examples where, you know, they haven't come out and fully embraced a universalistic view of salvation. But there are so many examples within the emergent church where uh, it's all, there's a, a, a very much an openness to to uh, considering and, and uh, almost endorsing non-Christian religious views out there today. If you just join me, I am interviewing Jason Carlson. The topic is the emergent church. You can find him on the web at Jude 3, the number 3, Jude3.com. Well, all that said about their quasi-universalism, what is their view on evangelism? Is saving the lost a priority with the emergent church? Well, you know, one of the things that you'll hear a lot about in the emergent church is uh, over and over again, the emergent church talks about themselves as being missional, that that is really their their bottom line unifying factor is that these churches claim to be missional churches. But the problem is that the emergent church has redefined what it is to be missional. Uh, When traditional evangelicals hear the term missional, we think about going out and sharing the gospel with people, telling them about the need to repent uh, and to enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, For the emergent church, they've completely redefined 
uh, the gospel and what it is to be missional. Uh, Brian McLaren, again, let me quote him from uh, ChristianityToday.com. Uh, Brian McLaren says, In many ways, the modern evangelical gospel is a message about how not to go to hell. When you step back and ask if that's really the gospel from Jesus' perspective, it's pretty hard to answer yes. When Jesus talks about the gospel, he talks about the kingdom of God. That offers a whole realm of questions that are more important. So, basically, what McLaren is saying here is that talking about hell and the afterlife and a person's eternal relationship with God, that's unimportant. What's really important for the emerging church is talking about the here and now, the kingdom of God here and now, bringing the kingdom of God into this world. And so, for the emergent church, when they talk about being missional, what they're really referring to is the idea that we as the church can usher in the kingdom of God into this world, that we can, through our lives, through our churches, transform society and make this world a, a better place, uh, uh, that we can bring the kingdom of God to earth uh, through, our, through our actions, through our social activism. And so you find a lot of uh, emphasis within the emergent church on social activism kinds of causes, but you find very little emphasis within the emergent church about traditional evan- evangelism, uh, sharing the gospel, calling people to repentance from sin, and calling people to embrace a relationship with Jesus Christ. Real quick, Jason, maybe about 30 seconds if you can do it. How can Christians demonstrate truth to an emergent church goer and cause them to maybe reconsider what they're involved in? Well, you know, I would just, uh, it, it's sometimes a tough thing to do, but I would just encourage people to uh, get them some good information, you know, share with them some of the resources like, like your radio show, point them to, uh, to good websites out there that are, uh, you know, putting articles out that are reaffirming truth and, and the authority of Scripture. Uh, there's a lot of great resources out there today uh, that that can kind of reaffirm for people the importance of maintaining a biblical Christian worldview with a strong adherence to absolute truth. So I would just simply encourage people to keep uh, to, to be in prayer and to keep providing uh, people with good resources. Gotcha. Thanks, Jason. If you're interested out there in a CD of this two-part interview on the Emergent Church, you can contact me. You can contact me at 610-513-5525. My website, again, is tower2truth.net. Again, that phone number is 610-513-5525. And don't forget to tune in next week for another apologetic issue facing Christianity today. And remember, don't just believe everything you hear, but test all things.